Welcome to Delling Pole, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pole. Welcome to the Delling Pole podcast with me, James Delling Pole, and my very special guest. I've been yearning to get him onto the show for some time. I've been a fan of his writings in The Spectator and elsewhere. And I finally met him at a party a few months ago. And I said, you've got to be on my, my... And he's quite shy. He's quite shy. His name is James Tooley. And indeed, I think you... Are you Professor James Tooley? I am, indeed, yes. Um, and you're... This is what's weird about you. Uh, well, one of the several things, probably. I don't know. You are Professor of Education... Education Policy, yeah. At Newcastle University. Mm-hmm. But you're not a crazed lefty. I mean, you must be about the only education professor in the world, anywhere at university, with, with tenure, who's not kind of lefter than Jeremy Corbyn. I, I, I suppose if, if there's any consolation, I, I used to be a crazed lefty um, when I was much younger. So, but you, you, you're right, there are very few of us. I wouldn't say I was the only one, but there are very few of us who are, uh, have, a, have a, a, a different disposition. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, so... You say you were a lefty. Um, what was your, what opened your eyes? I, I was a very late developer. Um, I it was not until I was around thirty, actually, late twenties, I started a PhD. I'd been a school teacher. I'd been a teacher in Zimbabwe. I went to Zimbabwe deliberately because I wanted to help Mugabe build this Marxist-Leninist regime. You know, it was really... You that, actually believed in the Marxist-Leninist stuff as well? I did. I, well, I, I was in two Das Kapital reading groups in Zimbabwe, you know, talking about this book as if it was a, as it was the Bible, you know, and really engaging with it, getting very excited about it, going to, um, you know, co-op, it, volunteering on co-op cooperatives, schools for the weekends and so on, that sort of thing. Yeah. But, it, it, and that didn't really, I mean, I, I did meet a libertarian while I was in America, uh, while I was in Zimbabwe from America. And um, he sort of, he, 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 he sort of said things that opened my eyes, you know, why are we allowing Mugabe, I had some chalk sent to me from England, why are we allowing the government to hold that chalk in customs so you have to go and pay you know, you pay money to, to release it. I, I had a few things like that. But no, I came back to England. I lived in South London, near Brixton, and I was volunteering for the Labour Party. And I started um, my PhD, and I was going to be against, it was going to be against Thatcher's reforms in education. You know, she was supposedly introducing a market into education. I was going to write against it. And I signed on with a, you know, a left wing professor. And, um, and then I read a book, Education and the State, by E.G. West. He's my hero, and this book opened my eyes. And that's what changed me. It was an intellectual conversion, if you like. I I read this book, and it was all about it's all about what was happening before the state got involved in education. How there was this amazing private market in education before the state got involved, and the state came in and sort of crowded it out, almost by accident initially, but then you know much more vigorously ah so and that was my conversion when was this book written so education in the state was um was 1965 published by the iea professor eg west as he became edwin george west um he was actually a lecturer in economics at newcastle university so he wrote it here and um and it, it's 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 still a brilliant book um, it's it's a book that will change the way you think about it. What, what, what changed for me, James, is um, it made me realise that the common sort of left wing problem, in a sense, is to start with where we are and assume any deviation from it has to be challenged. So we start with state education. So if we're trying to sort of perhaps relax the role of the state in education then that's got to be justified. And what he made me realise was actually, you know, state education might be this historical aberration. It's only 150 years. In two years' time, it's 150 years. It's only 150 years has been going on. What was happening before that, there was this amazing market in, in, pri- in private education. And that was, as it were, got rid of by the state. So we have to say, OK, the state itself has to be justified. State involvement in education and my PhD was actually then trying to see if there were any justifications and I concluded at the end of it there were not. That's 
just just before we go on to your your own research, I want to know a bit more about about these these private schools that existed before the yeah. state system came yeah. along. Yeah. So where, where, where were children educated in the early days? So so the, the, the best source for this, you know, forget Eddie West, forget my work or whatever, but it's it was a government report, the Newcastle Commission of 18, published in 1861, well, the Newcastle Commission did its research, very thorough research project in 1858, because the government was talking about getting involved in education. There were some small subsidies from 1833, well, some subsidies from 1833, but um, the government was trying, thinking about getting involved, and so they did a thorough research to see what was going on. And the Newcastle Commission found that 95.5% of kids were in school for six years, um, and they were in, so they were in the church schools, they were in philanthropic schools, they were in what we call now the public schools, you know, the, the uh, the Eatons and the Harrows and the whatever, but a significant minority were in what they somewhat disparagingly called the for-profit private schools or the adventure schools, and those are the schools that really captivated me, if you like, because they are the low-cost private schools which became the feature of my research we'll be talking about later on yeah. and my own interests and even where we're sitting now. Um, and uh, that is... So, so there was provision there, and the and the Newcastle commissioners were very disparaging about this provision, but nonetheless, it was there, and parents wanted it and and and, and loved it. Because I would imagine that if you ask most people, particularly those of a kind of leftish disposition, if you ask them about what what people did for schools before the state intervened, yeah. Yeah. they would say that actually children were often illiterate, that they had n that no education, mm. because who would provide it? Is that is that that that's the usual criticism and reading E.G. West made me realize there was actually another story and we've neglected this story. The Newcastle Commission, as I say, is a government report. It's not yeah. some crazed libertarian. It's a government report pointing to this amazing provision and being disparaging about it. So off the, I, I, well, I, maybe I shouldn't use these words on your podcast, but the, 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 I'm quoting from it. They would say often these for profit private schools are run by cripples. This is, this is a word they used. You know, and they were very disparaging about them and saying they can't possibly teach well. And then they gave some, they give some beautiful examples. But for example, one school run by a cripple, they said, um, which who, who who you know doesn't seem to be, you know we don't like him you know. And then they point out his next to a very prestigious church school, which is subsidised by government, very prestigious, run by a very prestigious head. And curiously, that school is half empty. The, the cripple the, was getting lots more. His school is overcrowded. And it turns out, and his school is more expensive than the prestigious church school. And it turns out that the parents from this prestigious church school, as soon as they can afford it, send their school, their children to this school. And why do they do it? Because he teaches things they want. Arithmetic, literacy, skills that are useful in work. The inspectors were very disparaging about this, you know, it's all very practical and utilitarian, not like what we want to do in our church schools. But nonetheless, it, they said it. These, these schools were serving what the people wanted, and the people responded accordingly. That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I, had a, I had a brief, a brief mm. taste of, of just how awful the, the left-wing education blob is. Catherine Burblesing, who is definitely going to be a podcast guest one yes, day, she's, she, she, I, 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 she keeps worrying that I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring her. It's mm. not. I love her. She's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I was there when she tried to set up a a, a school, um, one of those. What are they called? The, those kind of the free schools. Free schools. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Trying to set up a free school down the road from me in South London, and. The parents at the meeting, the local parents, it was like, you know, it was un like a United Colours of Benetton ad. I mean, they, they, were, they were all sorts, you know, mm. black people, mm. in, in, in Asians, Indians, whatever, mm. uh, white parents, working class, mm. sort, of, sort of upper middle class, y you name it. And we were all really keen on this project. But the meeting was hijacked by these lefties, all of whom were white all of whom I would say were middle class, and they positioned themselves at, at strategic points around the auditorium so that it would give the illusion of, you know, they'd frighten people and sort of give the illusion that there were more of them than there were. And they just disrupted the meeting and they, and they killed off the chances of... But I, I know that all parents really care about is that they want a good education for their kids. It's what they want, yeah. and they're not getting it often. Yeah, and what I, what I see, is, I don't know if you want to come on to this now, but 
all around the world. So my main work, I've given you an aside, really, this historical yeah. perspective. My main work has been in what, what we have to call developing countries, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia in particular, but also Central America and Latin America and other parts of Asia. Um, and, and there, uh, what, what, what I say is it's natural to parents to want to feed and clothe their children and to educate their children. It's as natural as feeding and clothing and giving them shelter. It's just a very natural um, response that parents have, and uh, it's universal. So you've been around the world mm. and looking at different education systems, mm. and you found something that I think that must drive the left absolutely mad. Yes, it, and it, it does drive, let's say, the left mad. It drives most people mad. Um, and I just... You know, I discovered it for myself. I mean, I use that word advisedly, but in a sense, I did discover it for the the West. Obviously, I, I, I went into some slums in Hyderabad. I was there almost twenty years ago, eighteen years ago, and it was partly because of E. G. West, what he'd said about the slums of Victorian England and all these private schools. I went into the slums of Hyderabad, thinking. Is it possible that I will find something similar? Because after my PhD, I'd become an expert on private education, yeah. because my PhD was a defense of private education. And I'd been asked to do these, these consultancies for the World Bank and the International Finance Corporation, which is the private arm of the World Bank. I'd been asked to do these consultancies looking at private education, but it's always for the, the elite. You know, everyone at that time thought private education is for the elite, for the you know the upper middle classes, and that didn't satisfy me as a person. I didn't want to be looking at stuff that helps the rich. You know, who cares about the rich? Not me. You know, and so I went and I went into the slums, almost hoping I might find something, and I did find something. You know, I went down an alleyway, and there was a low cost private school, and then another and another. So these are private schools for the poor, and it was that wonderful feeling of having an, a true epiphany. Now I'm an expert on private education, and private education is not about the elite. It's about everyone. It's serving everyone in the poorest slums of this world. And then I, I, I went searching for it, and I got a grant from the John Templeton Foundation. I went searching for this phenomenon in slums of Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, uh, in India, even in rural China, and found... So you got about... I, yeah, well, one, one of the reviewers of my book, The Beautiful Tree, which was about these adventures, said, I, this poor man is suffering from an overdose of wanderlust, you know, I got about, yeah. I mean, those were the countries I've named. Then, then we did research in Liberia, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, Somalia, because I, I wanted to see, I wanted to go to the ends of the earth, but I wanted to see what the poorest, you know, the most disadvantaged kids. Yeah. You can't get much more disadvantaged than the kids in South Sudan or Somalia or even Liberia, Sierra Leone. What are they doing? And what they're doing, their parents are choosing private schools for them. Uh, how? Because we're talking about the poorest of the poor. Well, so, yeah, I mean, we, this is one of the things that, you know, my critics now tie themselves up in, in, in knots about. So they say they're not serving the poorest of the poor. The poorest of the poor can't afford them. And so some proportion of the, even the poorest quintile or, you know, whatever yeah. of the population can afford them. Okay. Not everyone, but some can. But the poorest of the poor can't afford to send their kids to government schools either because Government schools, um, while being ostensibly free, you still need to have shoes, you still need books, you still need uniform, you still need transport, particularly as government schools are typically quite far away. And all these costs, I mean, our research in Liberia, we did household surveys there, which are similar to in Nigeria and Ghana, the cost of, to a parent of sending a child to a government school is 75% of the cost of sending to one of these low-cost private schools. So they're not, they're not free, you know. The private schools are more expensive, but not overwhelmingly right. more expensive. Do you, do you get what I mean? Yes, I do. Yeah. So what are we talking about? What are the fees at a school well, in so, Liberia? So, 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 so typically now, the sort of what I would call low-cost private schools, I have got a technical way of defining it, but we don't need to go into that. But, you know, typically in those sort of countries I've described, Nigeria, it might be about 10 US dollars a month that sort of fee. So the schools I run in Ghana and uh, in, in India, yeah, it's about $10 a month. That's a sort of typical, you know, seven pounds a month, something like and that. And as a proportion of the household budget? Yeah, so so it might be 10%, might be 
twenty percent, something like that. You know, it's so less than what we parents send our private to kids to yeah, private school in the yeah. UK. I mean, it's very interesting. You know, you're mentioning that because that that has been a source of well, it's a source of interest to me. You know, because w when I first came back from my you know long journey, you know, and started talking in conferences in America and England, um, and you know, describe, you know, poor, the poor parents, you know, really from that lowest quintile of wealth yeah. in the poorest slums. You don't get any poorer slums than those slums in Lagos or Monrovia, to be honest. I've seen all over the world. They, you know, they are the poorest slums. And the, ma the majority of kids, 70% of the kids in those slums are in private schools, okay? The private schools are outperforming the government schools. This is now well documented, very well documented. Um, and... They're affordable, they're outperforming the government schools. They are sustainable. They are run as businesses, and therefore, because they're sustainable, they're scalable. You know, so all those sort of holy grails of development are there. I mean, it's an amazing s success story yes. of the poor saying, we value education. When we don't like what government's doing, see the government's not doing it very well, or it's you know not catering to our needs at all, and we're going to do it ourselves, and su we're succeeding in doing it ourselves, and we're doing it better than the government without any, without a penny of aid or a penny from anyone else. We're doing it well. That was I mean, that was in parenthesis I was talking about that. So that's all there. Yeah, it's amazing. I'd come back to England and America, and tell them about the story, and people would say, well, why not in the, why not here, why not in England, why not in America? And I had to tell people I didn't know why not here, but my feeling was the private education here is so expensive. Only the top quintile of wealth can afford private education here. That's not that's not good. Yeah, we'll come to that in a moment. I, yeah, I, yeah. I first want to yeah. ask you why you think it is that these private schools are outperforming the state the, the state schools in the, in these various countries. I mean, I think I think the word is probably accountability, isn't it? Um, the, the the so so what my critics say, what the critics of this yeah. movement say yeah. is, these schools are rubbish. Look at their buildings; they're not as good as the state schools, and certainly not as good as schools we expect. Look at the teachers; they're not very well qualified. They haven't got all the certificates. They're not very experienced. They're young, and they're not very good compared to the government schools where the teachers are qualified, certified, yeah. they are experienced, they're older. And so that, uh, and all that is true. But these better teachers in the government schools are demotivated and they are unionized and they can never ever be removed. I was, I remember once being in one slum and talking to a, uh, an inspector who's coming, taking me around, and he said this, you know, we can, whatever the teacher does, we can never ever remove them. Um, only God can remove them, he said, and then he thought, no, not even God, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, and, and, so, and of course, in the private schools, the teachers are their employees, you know, and if they don't turn up and do the, what they're supposed to do, they might mm -hmm. get a warning. But in the end, they'll be removed. I mean, I, we ma we made a film for the BBC in 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 the slums in uh, in 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 Lagos, uh, Makoko, and we saw all the lively teaching going on in the private schools. Okay, it was a wonderful film we did for the BBC, and it was quite amazing. I got the BBC to do it and run it on Newsnight, in fact, and then um, later on, I think they thought it was a soft focus story of maybe one little school and you know against the odds. And then the people, the, the, the director was coming around, and we kept on stumbling on another private school, another private school. And then we interviewed the Minister of Education. And, um, and he realized it was a hard-hitting political story because we got permission to go into the state school. At, and there were three state schools on one site, and we entered the first classroom, the BBC cameraman, and the teacher was sitting there fast asleep at his desk, you know, and a little girl was taking the lesson. And... Um, you know, we showed that, and I felt difficult about showing it, but it happens all the time. If the teacher is there, they're not, they're, half the time they're not teaching, right. half the time they're not there. Um, and in the private schools, if you're not there, you get fired, let's put it blankly. And that's accountability, isn't it? There's an accountability. The parent pays fees, he or she knows the school is gonna give what I want, and if they don't, first of all, the teachers will maybe get fired, and if that doesn't happen, I'll take my kids somewhere else. So. 
it's not it's just in the West that there is this kind of state industry which wants to shut out the private sector. It's you you get this these same political tensions in Africa and in India. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the extraordinary thing about about my you know this is my life's work isn't it? For the last twenty years, I've been doing this, and in the beginning. It wasn't, there was just this total denial about it. So it wasn't like they wanted to shut it out. It was, everyone was in denial. So in governments, they maybe knew about these schools, not to the extent that they were there, but they, they had just the government schools. And, you know, the, the official figures from Lagos, for instance, they said 30% of the kids are out of school. And then when we did our surveys and census and so on, we said, actually, it's... 5% of the kids out of school, the rest of them are in these unrecognized private schools. Right. So there was, it wasn't so much they want to shut them out, they just, there was this denial. And because all the aid agencies, you know, they then, their officials on the ground are somehow in cahoots with the government. Yeah. They never go to these slums or seldom go to the slums and see for themselves. And so they would conveying back, yeah, it's government and out of school. And it was, so it wasn't that they were the word you were using, trying to shut them out, was more they were just in denial about their existence. Right. Now, once we started publicizing their existence, mm -hmm. then there is this feeling, yeah, this is, this is against, this is against what we, you know, what we stand for, isn't it? You know, yeah. This is the private sector, this is the poor, <laughs> you know, creating something which is, hang on, better than what we're yeah. doing, with not a penny from government, not a penny from international aid, and they're doing better than us. I mean, that's pretty damn threatening, isn't it? Uh, I'd say so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're listening to the Delingpole podcast with me, James Delingpole, and I think you ag you'll agree, totally fascinating guest, Professor James Tooley of Newcastle University. More in a moment. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. I want to actually take a couple of the references to Donald Trump from hip hop. And then we're going to try to see if we can figure out why they like Donald Trump. Jay Z said, I'm at the Trump International. Ask for me. Raekwon said, I'm the black Trump. They are comparing themselves to what he represents his wealth, his achievement, capitalism. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot. 125. This is Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Pool. Welcome back to the Pool podcast with me, James Pool, and my very special guest, Professor James Tooley, who's an education professor at Newcastle University. Now, James, I've got to ask you, um, how do you what sort of reception do you get when you go around to talk, talking at educational conferences? I mean, you must be about the only person of your opinions in the room. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, um, probably the last few years, I don't do that anymore. You know, when I was younger... Um, when you had a thicker skin. <laughs> had a thicker skin, and I had to get the word out, you know. Right, good point. You yeah. know, because, you know, as I, as I was saying earlier, everyone was in denial about the existence of these low-cost private schools, the vibrant private sector serving the poor, doing better than government schools. Everyone was in denial about it. So I just saw it was my duty to go out there and tell the world that it was actually different. And there was actually, it's much more, po to me, it's a much more positive story, you know, to use it. I mean, it's about people helping themselves, helping themselves and doing well. And I, I was, wanted to be the champion of that. But I must admit, I've sort of, yeah, I don't tend to go to this conference anymore because, yeah, it is a bit, it's a bit trying, to be honest, with people just sort of tend to come back at you and, you know, with the same arguments you've heard all the time and, they haven't listened to any of the evidence. Any of the evidence. The evidence is mounting up. It's very, very clear. These schools are better. They're there. Um, I do like going to sort of classical liberal conferences here in America, and people can get quite excited then. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure they do. I'm mm. sure you get get. Uh, you're you're a hero there. Mm. Um, and how did you get your PhD thesis finished? Given that you deliberately chose a lefty supervisor. Yeah, I, 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 you know, all, all fairness is Professor John White, wonderful man. He he actually quite enjoyed my change. So you know, he it, let's not say everyone is uniform. I mean, I I I I do know and love a lot of what you call lefty uh, education professors. I mean, I, I'm I'm I won't you know uh, let them be sort of put into a bunch together as it were. There's some great people out there, and he was great, and he sort of 
enjoyed the challenge in the end. And, and I got through, you know, I obviously got through my, my thesis examinations and so on, um, my, my vibe and my defense. And so it's not as if it was uniform, this is terrible. A lot of people thought that, but you know, there yeah. were enough people to say, okay, this is fine. Um, Trudy's argued well. That's the point, you know. This, this, and this is a coherent, sound argument. We don't like his conclusions, but actually, there, you know, he, he's argued well. Do you find that you get um, postgraduate students coming to you to choosing you as their their su- their PhD supervisor because they know about your reputation and that you know, I mean, yeah. classical liberals, for example. Do you, yeah, do you but but it's more it's more um, yeah. F- there are a few more people from what again, developing countries or the Middle East and whatever who want to do about private do something on private education, right. and typically they you know they've explored different other universities and they realise that they're going to do the work there, they're going to get. Um, you know, they won't get any sim- sympathy or understanding. Right. And, you know, Newcastle is quite a long way away for most people to come and, you know, do work. And there's, But, yeah, so some do come. But so you're bringing, you're bringing in the foreign dosh. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't overstate it, you know. It's, yeah. it's happening a bit. Yeah. Oh, that's, that, that, that's, that's good. That's nice, that's nice to hear. Yeah. And you, you mentioned that you've, you run some schools abroad yourself. Yeah, so, so I, I, I did all this, this research and I published a book, The Beautiful Tree, um, on the work and lots of academic articles and so on. And, and then, you know, as a... As a well, I, I, I was almost like a sort of reluctant businessman or, a, or an yeah. accidental businessman. Yeah. I realised that, you know, I had a few spare, spare pounds and thinking, well, why don't I try and, you know, try and imp- go along with what's already there and see if one can improve it. Not, not because I thought this was no, no good. In fact, I was the opposite. I was actually just almost overwhelmed with the quality of what I saw. But people from those countries would say, well, you know, we can improve it. We know we can improve it. Can you help us improve it? Yeah. And so I did co-found a chain of schools in Ghana, Omega Schools, um, which we expanded to 35 schools, 20,000 20, children fairly quickly. How many? Um, Twenty thousand, yeah. So um, you're you're what you're in charge of a network. That, that yeah. So that that's a network there in, in in Ghana. It's not as many children as that now, but it's um, uh, you know, that's one network. And I founded a couple of others in India. One I'm still involved with in Gujarat, um, Cadmus Academies, and I, you know, I, I've done some work in Central America as well. But you know, the, these are these are chains that are ongoing. I t- I tend to I, I'm quite good at getting things started and getting people inspired to get started. Yeah. I'm probably not the man to run the business in perpetuity. But that's, that's amazing. You're actually, I mean, most yeah. academics are not that... No, I, I took, uh, to be fair on me, you know, it was, wasn't I was abusing my university. I, I've taken about five years unpaid leave from the university. Right. Unpaid leave, not sabbaticals, unpaid leave, in order to do some of this work around the world in, in sort of two blocks. So I have, you know, because I've been so keen on getting this stuff done... Yeah. Um, and you know, as an academic, so many academics talk about areas which they um, they you know they talk about areas which yeah. they don't necessarily have experience of. Right. Um, having that experience of running these businesses, no. in, it, it, you know, it makes me realise it's so difficult. You know, it's what well, as an academic you can probably give the impression these things are much easier than they are. But I They're imagine much, more much less red tape is the not abroad. I mean, I. Just, just the experience of of, of, of of coming into whenever I visit a school, mm. the amount of stuff now that you have to go through to to protect the children from in case I'm a kind of child murderer, yeah. or, and, and the bureaucracy involved in when you want to plan a school trip and you've got to sign all these safety assessments, risk assessment for. Yeah. I wouldn't want to go into teaching now. No, but th- th- those things, those things are there, and, and and don't don't sort of underestimate the bureaucracy in other countries as well. Oh, really? And. You know, so so, so you know, the, the, these these things are there all, all the world over. Yeah. And do you? I mean, do you get an income from 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 these schools? No, I mean, I, I have I have shareholdings in, yeah. in these schools, and one one day, who knows, that might be worth something. But I I, I don't take any income. I've put money in right to these businesses. Um, but it was more for me to to see what was happening. Yeah. To see what was possible and the potential, and to have this. I mean, in, in in education, they they call it action research, you know. But it was it was a bit like that, you know, because it was actually the experience of seeing 
the difficulties, the challenges, the issues, getting things started was, was quite important to me. And to, to put my money where my mouth is is yeah. important. And um, yeah, well, one day, who knows, they, they might be worth something. Do you, do you, go, when you, go, you say you go to libertarian conferences in America. Mm. Uh, do, are you familiar with the American school system? I mean, a little bit. So I've seen some, I've been to see charter schools and, you know, that's, that, that sort of thing, yeah. I mean, which is, which is in more of a dire state, American system or education system or ours? I would think there are more dire schools in America. The, the, the schools that are dire are more dire in America than they are, are they? here. Yeah, I, I think so. The sort of potential violence and so on. But, you know, I, I mean, my, my feeling about the schools here, hmm. um, compared to what I've seen, let's compare it with Nigeria, hmm. um, you know, the, the state schools here, on the face of it, don't look too bad, you know, hmm. from the outside. You know, you don't, you don't get the same degree of complacency and, and so on. Um, as you do in in Nigeria, um, but you know, the teachers are there and they teach. There's a different sort of problem here, really, isn't there, with, in the schools? Yeah. What the, the 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 fact that we've got this? Well, I mean, child-centered learning was a sort of orthodoxy that came in what in the 1960s, 60s, 70s, yeah, and that can't have helped. No, it uh, it's well. I, I, you see, I, I am a gen. You know, I'm I'm a genuine free marketeer when it comes to education. So I don't want anyone telling us what should and should not be in education. Yeah. I, so, and, my, and, and I'm, I'm genuine. So, so look, and I, I'm, I'm also, I, I understand, you know, the academics talk about this, but it's true. Education is a contested area. You know, there will, because it's so cl- located with values, there will be genuine disagreements about what does constitute a good education, what is the best way of doing it. The evidence, empirical evidence, is very sparse, you know, partly because academic researchers have not really been focused on, you know, what really works and what doesn't. So I'm, I'm not against, you know, you mentioned child-centered education. If some great educator wanted to start, you know, a chain of schools which was just child-centered and they could show that it worked and they could attract parents and it was joyous and well, they full did. of learning. The, 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 you've got Frensham Heights and you've got Dartington Hall. Those were experimental <laughs> yeah. schools. And where Summer kids, Hill. And, and Summer Hill. <laughs> where those kids can do what the hell they like. And what do they do? They, sp- they shag one another. They, they bunk off maths classes and, yeah. and, and, and spend all the time in the and art school. That's fine. You know, I, I'm not going to condemn it if no. it's in the market. What, now, but the problem is... Um, because then it will just become a, you know, it'll become a sort of um, an odd thing that goes on. And and what I condemn or what I don't like is the idea of taking those ideas into the state sector and saying, this is what you've got to do. This is the way the schools are going to be run. And this is the only way of doing it. Aha. But now we come on to the uh, interesting part. Yeah. I A little bird tells me mm. that you are setting up your own your own chain of what what are they called independent grammar schools yeah and and this is this is based on that whole whole idea that i told you about really that you know when i've been i've been asked this question why doesn't it happen here and i look around and see there are no low-cost private schools but i see that there's the private schools that are there are only affordable by the elite and a couple of years back i couldn't travel i wasn't traveling for various reasons um, and um, so I did some market research with a couple of students on the streets of Newcastle. And to my surprise, you know, the question, would you like private education for your children? You know, people said, of course we would like it. You know? <laughs> and I did some similar research in the streets in um, Philadelphia. Of course we'd like it. Um, and uh, so why, why didn't you say, well, of course, we can't afford it, you know. So if there was a private school that was, what, £50 pounds a week, could you afford it? And some could, you know. And then I devised a business plan. I got together with some two friends and colleagues, and we decided to start the Independent Grammar School, the first one of which is the Independent Grammar School, Durham. And um, it started. We, it took us 485 days to get approval, to start and um, we are so excited about it you know the, so what was the that 485 days is that that sounds quite a long time to me yeah it was a long time yeah. well I mean why why couldn't you set up a school there, there are regulations there are approvals there are 
Are we talking about the state trying to shut out competitors? Look, it... Yes. <laughs> The, 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 it was it was hard. It was partly because, look, here's an example. Okay, mm. so you have to have a pre a pre opening inspection by Ofsted. Okay, mm -hmm. and so we had followed all the regulations. Yeah, we'd gone through all the regulations that require for private yeah. schools, and clearly you needed a, a sick bay. Let's use that as one example. Right, um, and various other things, but to take, take the sick bay. So then we'd got our costed architect's plans to show. You know, this is the sick bay, and this is what it costs, and we're going to produce this as soon as you approve us. Yeah, and we failed the inspection because you're supposed to show the inspectors the sick bay. You're not supposed to show them the plan of the sick bay. Oh, for goodness' sake! So, so you've got to be, in other words, you've got to risk your money before you can get a, approved. It's a catch twenty two. If you don't risk your money, you definitely won't get improved, approved. But if you do risk your money, you might not. Anyway, so it was it, that was the that was the thing really. We we, we hadn't realised that, and so that wasted well, that re really wasted a whole year, you know, because we were going to open the inspection happened, and it took a while for us to be told. But this was actually you know we hadn't done, for example, the sick bay. We'd only said we we're going to do it. So then we learned that from that mistake, we then did everything. We had a second inspection and we passed. And uh, then it takes a while to get approved, but eventually, as I say, we got approved and we opened in September this year. So, okay, so you say that you don't like to dictate how people run their schools, yeah. but you obviously got an idea in your head yeah. of what the curriculum and the ethos mm. of a your ideal school should be. So tell me about that. Well, uh, and but you know, not that I want to dictate it. Obviously, I mean it will be dictated in these, the yeah, in, in these schools, in these schools. Um, but you know, I'd love to see competitors coming in and saying, well, they could say the same thing, but they could say well, actually we want to do something slightly differently. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely not into the idea that we 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 dictate what 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 the what the market can provide in this area. But this school, the independent grammar school, Durham. It's very traditional. It has a, a traditional knowledge-based curriculum. You know, we're very happy that the kids <laughs> learn poems by heart. We're yes, very, yeah, I we're love very, that. We're very happy that the kids learn historical dates and sequences. Dates, you know, yes. So we've got, you know, around the, the classrooms, we have historical, the process of what very happened good. when in history. I mean, you know, a personal anecdote here. I, I feel very deprived of this. You know, I, I, I was a sort of victim of uh, that word victim. I yeah, yeah. use it too easily, but we all use it now, don't we? I, I was a victim. Yeah, I, I, I was a victim too. <laughs> something, I'm not sure. Yeah. I was a victim of that, that um, progressive learning. You know, I had a terrific primary school. Yeah. And that, I think, is what enabled me then you know, to, to at least achieve something. But then the secondary school, the co I went to a state comprehensive in East Bristol. And it was, it was that 1970. It was that time when, you know, that. The idea of comprehensive education was just, you know, it was a free for all. You know, yeah. we, there was no setting or streaming until you know the, the the O level year as it was then, and it was a, it was a mess. You know, so I used to play truant from the school to go to the library because that was the only place I could read and do any studying. You know, and anyway, when I was sixteen, some kids burnt the school to the ground, and that was pretty much what we all thought of it really. And did, did, so did you go somewhere else after that? Or? Um, I dropped out of school when I was 17. And then right. God, is that, isn't that weird that, you've, that yeah. what you've ended up doing? Yeah, but it's, but it's because I don't want kids to be in that situation. You know, you go into a... I was a bright kid. You, you, see, you see kids in those schools, you know, kids who are not able to do any work because everyone else is messing around, you know. You know. And, and even if it's not serious mess around, the sort of low-level disruption that goes on um, is, is very harmful. So I want the school to be very disciplined. I want the school to have no low-level disruption. I want the school to really um, enable all the talents to flourish, including if you're intellectually <laughs> uh, motivated to allow you to flourish and to allow all your... Uh, skills and you know, your 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 potential to come through, and um, but putting stuff into long term memory is very important. Yeah. I, I I'm with you. And wh wh where are you on Latin? Yeah, I, I'd like Latin. I, yeah. I'd like to have Latin and 
even ancient Greek, because these things are good for, 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 for understanding the structure of language. They're, I mean, people say, well, why would we ever want to learn these languages? You can read everything in translation. It, things get lost in translation, and you know, if you ever want to really, really understand what the great ancient Greek and Latin authors were writing about, read them in their own language. But it's a great structure thing. This, again, it's, a great, this, it's about the learning discipline of engaging with a grammar of a also, subject. Also, if you are going to call yourselves grammar schools, that's that, the original grammar schools, they taught Latin yeah. and, and yeah. Yeah. Greek yeah. grammar. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because, again, you know, we've got lots of critics. The, the unions don't like what we're doing here. And one of the things they're criticizing, why are you calling yourself a grammar school? You're not selective. You're not even... You know, it's secondary, and I like to point out that actually, grammar school is a name that was used to describe an all through, um, an all through school going from primary to secondary school, a, 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 pri a private school, a genuine private school. If you go to different parts of the world now, go to Australia for instance, you'll find all of the old established private schools are called grammar schools, and apparently, I, I, I only hear this. I think I read it on the, on the internet, but. Uh, elementary schools in America, a synonym for elementary is in fact grammar school. So the name is is um, is not as it, the, in 1944 the state, as it were, hijacked that name yes. and said grammar school was about a secondary a, uh, a secondary selective school. That's not what we mean here. No, we mean about introducing all children. We're not selective. Introducing all children into the grammar of different subjects. Yeah, isn't isn't really the the grief that you're getting from the from the blob, from the education yeah. establishment. Yeah. It's really these people don't want to be shown up in the same way that the state schools in, in Lagos were evident like being shown up by these Yeah, these it's upstarts. possible. But, but you know, and I, you know, here you're getting get annoyed with me, James, because I'm, I'm going to say that same thing as I said about the professors. You know, the blob, yeah. the people who do, uh, the people who've been the inspectors and, yeah. you know, been the officials that have come to visit us here or we've had to visit, they couldn't be nicer people up here, you know. It's not, it's not as if they're as people opposed to what we're doing. It's the, the regulatory environment, the environment they, that gets, you know, that we're sent from down south, you know, to, that's the sort of, that's the, that's the blob. It's not the people themselves. And so that, you know, I, I wouldn't say that they are particularly motivated and of course the unions love uh, love yeah. the love the sinner hate the sin yeah exactly yeah. yeah yeah but the um exactly that's that's how i feel and hope you know but the unions of course remember the unions have an interest in promoting the welfare of teachers and they do that incredibly well that doesn't mean to say they're promoting the welfare of children and education you know and sometimes those coincide yeah. but there's no there's no logical reason why the interests of teachers should coincide with the interests of, of children and very often doesn't so but they they're doing their job and they're doing it very very well but they do i mean it's very interesting how the unions are so um you know they are they, they don't like the school being here and i guess it mm. is a threat because the the fees are rather low yeah yeah, I mean, I'm amazed that you can give a child a private education for 50, 52 pounds a week. Yeah, so. over the whole year, so that's, you know, 2,700 a year, yeah. Yeah, but that's not, but yeah. really... But, but, you know, the building is very, very simple. It's a nice building, but it's very, very simple. Our teach, oh, so was, we economise on the building. We, we, we recognise that if you've got great teachers, um, you don't need a lot a lot more you know you don't need lots of stuff that gets wasted in other schools you know and you can you can do frugal education i, I learned this from my work in africa and my work in india you know seeing people doing frugal education and i think you can do it here as well yeah that's another reason i'm afraid to say why you are unpopular with the blob because they're you hear it all the time on the on the, on the news on the bbc mm. what they want is they want they need more resources oh, always sorry. they need more resources yeah yeah, yeah. And, yeah, more resources are always nice, you know. Yeah. But they can be very destructive if you all... If you, if you see the solution to every problem is more resource, then sometimes you don't realise there is an easier solution, which is more to do with you and the way you deal with that problem. Um, yeah, so that it can be... It, it, it can be very destructive, that uh, idea. You're listening to the Dellingpole Podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very... Another James, my, my special guest, James Tooley. 
more in a moment. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlow. Censorship is a key issue here, particularly for people on the right. Do you think it was addressed adequately? Definitely not. It was useful to name check Diamond and Silk. It was useful to check even politicians who had campaign ads that were shut down. But in every case, Zuckerberg was allowed to essentially dismiss the case and move on. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Poll, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Poll. Welcome back to the Delling Poll podcast with me, James Delling Poll, and my very special and exciting and wonderful guest, Professor James Tooley, the only, <laughs> the only classical liberal education professor in the world, probably. Well, the only one I've ever met. Anyway, James, I met you for the first time at a party a few months ago mm. and I was dying to ask you about something I'd read about your having been to an Indian prison which I think is a, a, an extraordinary story because uh, I think most of us just imagine how horrible it must be going to prison in India so please just one more time t- first of all how on earth did you end up in an Indian prison yeah, I mean, it's it's a long story, and I did write a little memoir on it. It's called In Prison in India, so, you know, people can oh, okay, yeah. read, read the full story. Um, it was catharsis. I wrote it for catharsis, cathartic reasons. Um, no, it was really... Why, why was... Shall, shall I say, I, 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 I was... Got, I got caught up in some some police corruption you know I, I, I think for the police in, in India they see someone a foreigner whose name is on a trust um, they're low hanging fruit because there are so many regulations around trusts which are very small uh, penalties attached to them but nonetheless the police themselves this is a legacy unfortunately of the, um, the British um, police code which is still there used in India they've got almost unlimited discretion to do what the hell they like so if a little a little um offense committed not a not, nothing criminal nothing like that against the you know the uh, the 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 regulations on trust they can arrest you and they can throw you in prison <laughs> and that's what happened to me and this woman she she was very clear what she was after she was after twenty five thousand dollars and and then i could be be, be let go um and uh i i mean it it's you know, quite a lot of money. It's a lot of money, yeah. I mean, initially, she was, I mean, when she was sort of interviewing me prior to having my having me arrested, um, she she understood that I was a professor at a good university, and and she indicated that she had two sons who didn't have a father, and they would be very happy at a British university, and and I didn't I didn't get the I didn't get the idea you know, I didn't quite understand what she was after but had I perhaps I could have promised her something and got away with it but anyway um, that was it a corrupt police officer using discretionary powers introduced by the British British circa 1860 1861 um, and uh, threw me in prison but you know I it's one of those things yeah imagine an Indian prison and I bet for any of your listeners, it's ten times worse. The reality is ten times worse than what you can imagine. So I, I but but also, I saw the best of humanity there. Oh, but I, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I want to hear about the worst first. No, you, no, I, I t- I'll tell you the, the best. I don't want to discuss no, the no, worst. But I, I want I, to know about how horrible the prison. Okay, was. well, I, I don't want to dwell on it. But okay, so I, so I was, you know, this 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 policewoman accompanied me to the prison, having got this um this uh, judge to, to sign me off. Um, and uh, we arrived there on a Saturday evening. We arrived at six o'clock in the evening. And I came to my cell. The, as you arrive, you get a cell on your own and then you get distributed around. And it was hmm, 10 foot square, I guess. Nothing in it at all. No, not, there's no furniture, nothing. And there's a little hole over there for, for a latrine. Um, apart from, in my case, there were three piles of shit on the floor, you know. Um, what, from the, the, uh, they hadn't well, bothered uh, clearing up. So you know that was it, and then so they lock you in there, and then that's six o'clock at night, and so and and this policewoman said you can't take anything with you, um, but don't worry, everything is provided. You know, so I was, I was, sta- you know, I had a jacket and 
and they're taking my belt and stuff like that. But I, you know, and, and I was standing there, and then the prisoners from across the co corridor sort of crowded round, and um, I said, you know, hi, and I said, well, so when's food? I'm a little bit hungry. And they said food was you know, a couple of hours ago. There's no food now till tomorrow. This is six o'clock. Okay, fine. Where, where do I get water? I said. Um, they said, uh, you know, water was two hours ago. You can't get any water till tomorrow. I said, okay, fine. This was March in Hyderabad. A bit chilly now at night. I said, when do they bring blankets? I said, you should bring your own blankets, you know. I said, fine, okay. And sort of I had to digest that, that knowledge. I had no food, no water, no form of comfort. Anyway, ten minutes later, they called again from across the corridor. And amongst themselves... The prisoners had collected together a blanket, an orange, an apple, bread, jam, water from amongst themselves. And at risk to themselves, they then called the, the jailer, who could have been nasty. Yeah. Most jailers were brutal. I mean, the jailers were often brutal, but called the jailer and transferred it across to me. And, you know, once you have that experience of, you know, this was not the Shawshank Redemption. This was prisoners looking after each other, looking after you. And it was the finest experience. It was an experience I will never, ever forget and I will never, ever regret having had to see the humanity that can come in that dire situation. I mean, the, the thing about prison I discovered was in, in India, there's this word, I don't think we've, I've ever heard it before, an under trial. And an under trial is someone who is in prison awaiting, sometimes awaiting trial, but often awaiting charge. It's not this, and sometimes they've been in prison one, two, three years awaiting charge because they're too poor to afford a lawyer and too poor to go to court. You know, it's disgraceful. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, it upset me so much when I, dis when I, you know, I learned that, that some of these people I was getting to be friends with were there pre-trial, pre-charge. You know, that's pretty disturbing. And because they were usually victim of some corruption and thrown in prison and then they couldn't afford to get out. I knew people I got out. Um, but, don't, you know, so don't ever say, you know, oh, the humanity of people is beautiful. You know, you see some, that was beautiful. I, I believe that without, without needing to go to an Indian experience, <laughs> prison to have really? the experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm going to take yeah. your word for it, James. Yeah. But, but I think a lot of us, you know, when we hear people who've, been through experiences like that we had a we had another brilliant guest on the podcast called sean langan yeah. who was held prisoner by the taliban yeah. for for i think well many months yeah and, but mine was, was a very small yeah very tiny experience but, but nevertheless yeah, yeah, yeah the questions i want to ask you are things like yeah. how bad are the mosquitoes the mosquitoes are bad and then so then i got transferred to the you know i, I was only there you know it's a matter of you know one or two weeks and then after yeah, four that's months. Enough. Yeah, so then got transferred to the foreigners uh, wing which was full of uh, I mean all the Indians told me you can't go there you've got to pay the bribe you can pay a bribe to the, the within prison you can pay bribes to get better rooms and I yeah. could have stayed with the Indians um, but I was sent to the night where all the foreigners which were basically Nigerians who were all on drug things you know? yeah and and so basically a room you know not very big 20 foot by 10 12 of us lying side by side, six, you know, with just literally on the floor, just a blanket there. Um, so the mosquitoes are bad, but the funny thing is there's no beds, but there were bed bugs. <laughs> and so he used to get eaten alive by these bed bugs. Um, that was horrible. But you see, you're, you're laughing about it now. <laughs> I, I, I think I would have been, the thought of being eaten by bed bugs is so traumatic. Yeah, I think was, I would have been so mad. But, but, but where you, and, and you do go through that, you know, even after a very short time as in prison, I must stress that, um, but if you do have that dark night of the soul, you know, when you think, because the other thing is you don't know how long this is going to last. Yeah. And it lasted a very short time for me because I had people in, I knew high, people in high places, you know. Um, but you have that dark night of the soul where you think this, you know, I can't get through this. But then I found, and you find some hidden resources inside you, but you also find this love of humanity. You know, this is what I'm trying to say. This, The people around you, Get you through it, and you so, get them. So the Nigerians it. must have been pretty badass, were they? They were wonderful. I, they you know, because I work with you know I worked in Nigeria. I wasn't afraid of anything like this, and they were fine. And they were you know they have a reputation Nigerians, but they were fine. They looked and we played chess. And, and could you, I imagine yeah. you could speak some of their dialects as well. Not really, no? no. But English is official. No, language, yeah, 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 sure. So, so it was fine. Um, but 
you know, and, and to link with my work, I mean, in my interrogations, there's a chapter in The Beautiful Tree called An Inspector Calls, where I talk about corruption of the police in Hyderabad, India. I talk about that as part of it, and, you know, that kept coming up in my interrogations. So was I partly there because I'd been oh. found because of my work or just this... Anyway, whatever it was, it was, you know, there was a link. Um, and uh, as I say, I... I certainly don't regret having the experience. Um, I, I'm. How long? How long ago was this? It's only four years. Four years. Oh my God! Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. So it's still quite. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Do you but think it damaged you in any way? I mean, uh, do you get nightmares or? No, not, no, not, no. Not, not, not. But sorry, I, I'm not going to let you get off with the, just the mosquitoes. I want to know. <laughs> did you? Was there anything you can do about the mosquitoes? No. So you just get bitten. You swat them. <laughs> but how do you sleep? Well, you cover the blanket over your head, don't you, and that sort of thing. You have a blanket. Right. Um, it's, it's really not, it's, I, I don't want to, uh, uh, it's such a minor experience. I mean, what I want to stress is I saw the humanity there and no. it was a very short experience and I wrote a book about it because obviously I was upset about it, very upset, but I was most upset about this, the state of the under trials. You know, I got to know yeah. people who were stuck there. I helped a few get out, you know, by giving them the money to go to lawyers, but you know, did you? you? Yeah, but you can't do that. For, you can't do. You can't do, do it for, for all of them. Two, you know, and the, there are thousands of these people stuck there. Um, you know, I I did come out thinking I must do something about it, and then eventually, you know, in the end, you think, well, my work is in education in schools, and perhaps the more you can improve that the education of people, the more you can improve, the more you can undermine corruption. You know, corruption is an evil in these places. Corruption is destroying these countries, and that I'm describing, even India, you know, the, the society is so corrupt. Yeah. And the better educated people are, the more capable they are of standing up and, you know, asserting themselves, and perhaps, you know, the more they will be able to resist this sort of... Um, stuff that's going on there well that's why we bonded i think because mm. you and i are on the same mission we mm. want to save the world in detail um <laughs> <laughs> and uh did did i ask you last time i saw you yeah. i was very taken by a documentary i saw mm. uh, on netflix about a school called shanti bhavan um which, right. which which takes on the children of the untouchables Yes. Do you know about that? I, I don't, but yeah, I can look it up. Yeah, but yeah. but there is so much there is so much extreme poverty in in India. It's like yeah. a sort of it's like a playground for one's kind of philanthropic fantasies, and and there yeah. is so much what we can do, isn't there? Yeah, there's so much we can do. There's so much we can do wrong. I mean, it's very hard to do good. I, you know, I, I don't want to get into this now, but you know, sometimes you try and do good. And you end up doing more harm than good. It's, it's, there's a philanthropic trap, us Westerners. The aid forward. agencies. The aid agencies. And there's this terrible case from Liberia in the last week or so, which you know, we don't need to talk about. But it's just, it's frightening, the mistakes you can make. I'm sure I've made mistakes. And, and, and what we must never do, you know, is go in there, it, it, you know, you must never go to these places and think, I can be the savior of this. Go there and try and do a little thing. You know, okay, I can see... Well, first of all, I mean, I, I went there to learn. I mean, this is, in a sense, I can be, feel proud about this because yeah. I, I was just amazed. I was thought, isn't this incredible? They're not, they, they're not acquiescing in the mediocrity of the state. They're not being welfare recipients. They're not saying, we can't do anything ourselves. They're saying, we can do something ourselves. Yeah. We want to do something and we do it and we are doing it and it's better than anything else. I just thought this is an amazing learning experience. I didn't want to do anything when I discovered that. And then people said, can you help us improve X, Y, and Z? And so I tried to improve X, Y, and Z and maybe managed to improve one of those things a little bit. But, you know, it's very, it's the easy thing to go in there and think, you know, um, I think one can do wonderful things. You can do very little. But, um, but I think the most important thing I did was catalogue the nature and extent of this phenomenon of low-cost private schools serving the poorest communities, doing better than anyone else. I catalogued it. I told the aid agencies, I told the academic world about it and made people realise that the only possibility for educating children isn't government, isn't the state. Yeah. There are other alternatives. That's, what's in, that's, you know, that's in a sense what I can feel proudest about doing. And in a way... You know, the, there's a danger in trying to do other things. You know, we 
we can misunderstand, we can yeah. do things the wrong way. But hopefully, some things have to well, I tell you what yeah. I hope, James, having, having met you and uh, mm. been inspired by you, I think mm. you are a hero. I do hope that your, your um, independent grammar schools mm. really take off, because I think there is a very much a need for them. Yes. And so I, I don't know how many special friends, my, my special, I, I have one <laughs> special friend who listens to me. Um, I don't know whether they're based in Durham or not, but if they want to send their child to Durham, Yes. Um, the school's opened? The, the Independent Grammar School Durham has opened. Yeah. And uh, that's... There, for for, still, for what age? There's still places available from age uh, four to nine at the moment. Um, but it's, we, we'll extend that. We will be opening other schools, hopefully, Independent Grammar School. In the north? So, or, yeah, or we're just working in the northeast at the moment because it's be- best to keep sort of, you know, geographically focused so we don't... Uh, you know, we can keep an eye on all the schools. But yeah, we hope hopefully opening schools here. Others are trying to do similar things down south and other parts of the world, uh, other parts of England and, 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 and the United Kingdom. So um, I, I've been amazed at the interest in this. I mean, I, you know, I am one of those people who I, I like attention yeah. and I want to draw attention to the work I'm doing in India and Africa. You know, I've always... And I didn't want to draw attention to this because this is very small scale. It's, you know, I wanted to get started before I started anyone, before anyone noticed it. Amazing how people have come in and noticed it. You know, the newspapers keep trying to run stories. They keep phoning us. We keep telling them we're not talking about it because, you know, let's let this little acorn grow. Yeah. But, but the interest in it shows, I think... That there's a hunger. There's a hunger. And in fact, you know, going back to some of you, what, something you said earlier, you know, I've had left left wing professors come up to me at conferences, um, so I still occasionally go yeah. and saying to me, "Had this been around when I was, young, <laughs> <laughs> I would have used this for my kids." You know, <laughs> don't tell anyone. <laughs> well, I'm not mentioning any names. Yeah, yeah. But it's absolutely true. And I've had, you know, and the Guardian. There's a journalist from the Guardian wrote more or less the same thing. I'm totally against private education. Um, but if this works, can I really be against this? <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then Peter Wilby, the editor of the New Statesman, who's uh, the, the erstwhile editor of the New Statesman, who's a you know is a dear man, and um, he he wrote a piece in the New Statesman, clearly believing we it will work and it will be attractive to parents. He's worried about that, but nonetheless, he understands its attraction to parents, and you know he understands just about that the the economics of it can make it work as long as it can be big enough. Good, right. Well, thank you very much. You're listening to the Darling Pod podcast with me, James Darling Pod, and my very special guest, and I hope future educational millionaire, he deserves it, <laughs> Professor James Tooley. Thank you and goodbye. Right Bart News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Menesor. I said that it's the epitome of hypocrisy. Unless you fall in line with their liberal agenda, this uniparty globalist liberal agenda, they will never support you. They, they, they use the whole gender issue, of course, as some kind of tool to prop up their, their messaging, but it's the phoniest thing. Sirius XM Patriot Channel 125.